Thanks for staying with us. Now, we can't overemphasize the influence of governors in our lives. Referencing an article on stairs, governors have a profound influence in our lives. It's their responsibility to provide infrastructure and an environment that ensures our quality of living. Now, the provision of public primary and secondary school education for our children and the regulation of private schools lies in their hands. Sanitation, water, Roads are also part of their duties as the federal powers can only do so much. Now, the Lagos gubernatorial election is fast approaching. I want to know what these candidates are saying and what uh, is their way or what is their why and what are the challenges in Lagos and what will they do differently. Now, please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 803 You can also tweet at us at Wayshu Africa one with the hashtag Wayshow. All right, so before I bring in our candidates, um, um, Diola, I just wanted to hear your thoughts, first of all. How well, um, but how excited are you for the coming elections in Lagos State? Uh, Lagos State? You know, everybody's really, really focused on the presidential, but we need to, we, we can't forget that we also have a state you know, um, that needs to also work. So how, how excited are you for the coming elections in Lagos State? I'm curious, actually. Okay. Because, um, I mean, there are so many players now, and um, I'm really curious as to the readiness of the people in the state, if we're truly ready for something different, or is it going to be business as usual, considering the fact that um, PDP and APC, you know, have been, they've been major players. So with the, with, with the new players now, are we really ready to listen to what they have to say? Now, I think we need to listen first or, you know, go with their rhythm, you know, to be able to now decide if we, when we get to the voting um, poll to mm. say that, oh, okay, um, these people are saying something different, you know. So I have a lot of questions for them, you Absolutely. know, interested. You, for I have enough. a lot of mm. questions as well because, again, if you look at Lagos State's, you know, zeroing it on the challenges of Lagos mm. State. It's too numerous to two, count. Two, and, you two, know, yeah. So it's so interesting how you hear Lagos State being used as the postal uh, was it child. called child for <laughs> a presidential election. And I'm mm. wondering, is it the same state that I'm living that mm. is being used? Because again, if you want to really define, I mean, I was reading something about mega cities because mm. that's what they always say, yeah, Lagos is a mega city. Sure. If you want to define it, the only thing that qualifies Lagos as a mega city is probably the population. Yeah. You know, but in terms of what the kind of an infrastructure that a mega city sure. deserves or the kinds of, um, what's ease it called? Of business, ease, ease of business. Ease of business, business yeah. You know, I don't think it qualifies to be called that. But hey, it's not in my place to say it, but let us call in the people that want to govern Lagos State. <laughs> my name <laughs> Rhodes Viver is the Lagos State um, uh, Labour Party governorship candidate, and he was a PDP senatorial candidate for Lagos um, Senatorial West, um, one of the beneficiaries of Not Too Young to Run movement. He's an MIT-trained architect with a master's in public policy from the University of Lagos. He has an interest in architecture, design, construction, and commodity trading. While Princess Adiodun Oyefusi is the Labour Party governorship candidate, she is the governance um, partner and company secretary with TLGP Partnership, a law graduate with merit and holds an MBA. She's an associate of the Chartered Governance Institute of the United Kingdom and Ireland and the daughter of the late Ayambure of Ikorodu. Now, thank you so much. And both of them have joined us live in mm. studio. <laughs> thank you so much, buddy boy, thank and you thank you so much, princess. First of all, um, you guys are not strangers to ways, so I'm very excited that now finally we get to talk to you on the conversation around, you know, what it is that you have been doing for the past few months, which mm -hmm. is actively participating in politicking, uh, what's it called, campaigns, and all of that for towards, you know, winning the elections for the Lagos State government. Um, Lagos State, rather, position, go governor's position and deputy. I mean, so, I mean, this conversation is something that I, I really want us to take in as much as possible as we can put in. So I'd like to, first of all, ask, right, I'll come to you, um, Badivo, how well do you understand the unique challenges of Lagos? Oh, yeah, Again, yeah. because I say this because when I was trying to research what exactly, what questions would I say, would I ask that has not been said in different quarters and all of that, you know, sometimes I think the reason a lot of people take, 
irrational decisions or they take um, uninformed decisions is because they really do not understand the unique problem of what it is that we're dealing with. So I hear Lagos State all the time coming up as the state to, to, to look up to mm -hmm. you know, for an election. And I'm wondering, a state that is filled with, um, what's it called, um, touts, miscreants, there's a lot of, um, what's it called, there's a lot of gang activities going on actively now in your faces. There are so many things. We have issues with our transportation system. We have issues with garbage management, right? We have these issues with infrastructural deficits. Like the challenges in Lagos State as it is, is too numerous to count. And guess what? This is the state that is being used as a postal state. I've been to other states and I can tell you the structures of those states perform way better than a Lagos state. And I keep wondering how, first of all, how people have been able to manage, you know, this narrative over the years that Lagos State is the state to look out for. And why are people not even challenging it? So I'm happy that you guys have come out, uh, come out to the front to challenge it. But really, do you really understand the challenges that we face as Lagosians? Yeah. yeah. Certainly. Um, first of all, I think it's important that we understand that Lagos State has been run as a tokenist state. It's the poster child for politics. You find that as you get into elections, you start to see things like the blue line. You start to hear about the Fort Mainland Bridge mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. You start to hear about health insurance that the they've seaport. supposedly been doing. Mm -hmm. And all of these things, they used to make headlines. And then as soon as the election is over, everything reverts back to status quo. But you see, Lagos State has earned a right, a place in Nigerian history because it was once the political, the economic capital of this country and it was a place where literally most of the people that fought colonialism were based out of and literally that is why it was called it is called it well it is supposedly the center of excellence, excellence yes. right i mean i was saying earlier today that as far back as 1910 darocha was pumping water for me due to lagos island mm. people that grew up that claimed to be political leaders grew up in lagos where when they opened their tap water was coming out they could go to hospitals and get proper treatment, mm. right? Now they fly about to get injection. So, you see, in all of that, there's been a situation where Lagos City has experienced state capture. And the resources, the huge amount of resources that is supposed to be used to push this growth and this development, especially for the burgeoning population, because this population, they're not idle human beings. These are people that are extremely productive. Yes, our productivity can increase significantly. But when you understand the level of IGR that we generate, it's not being generated from the floor or the wall. It's being generated from human beings. Yeah. So, these resources that should be used to push legal state, infrastructure-wise, human capacity development-wise, they have been used to benefit a few group of people and their cronies. And this then reflects in the state of squalor that most of Lagos is in. Forget this Ikeja to Lekki mm -hmm. thing. Once you go, go off the express road, then you really see what Lagos is about. Mm -hmm. You go to places like Suruleri that was once in the heyday, like, you know, a place where elite people lived, right? Go inside Suruleri, see the, the quality of the inner roads, mm -hmm. complete mess. And another thing about Lagos, that has caused this problem is how the local government system has been completely amputated. Mm. A situation where they send people there that are just that Figure are loyal out. to the party. Yeah. They are glorified contractors, mm. right? In our government, we're going to have local government chairmen that are potential governors, mm. right? Because that's the only way to to create excellence at that level of governance, and it must be excellent if Lagos State is going to work. Okay. So, um, uh, Diola, I'll, I'll let you come in because you just said something I don't want to lose my train of thought. When you talk about a structure for any form of governance, right, I'm happy that you're bringing it from the local level all the way to the state level. Yeah. In terms of the state assembly, how prepared is Labour Party, do you understand, to run the election? Because, again, there's an assembly that has to be filled. Because this is, the same this is the same narrative that has been spread in the federal level mm -hmm. that, I mean, senators, your House of Rep members, you know, if you do not have Labour Party, and how does it impact, you know, the position? So even if you are then elected, right, and you then have some form of cabinet that is working against you, how do you stand if, you know, 
your local government chairman, your, what's it called, your House of Assembly members, and all of, all of those people represent different kinds of parties that are not in line with your vision. How do you f hope to align that, you know? Yes, I think, uh, as Princess knows as well, we have a full deck of candidates, right? It went through a court process, and the courts have given INEC um, an, an order to open the portal for our candidates to be uploaded. So we have a full set of assembly members, full set of House Rep members. Um, I know for a fact that there are two senators, and one is still going through a court process, but we have a full set of candidates. So that is not something I'm worried about. What I'm worried about really is to ensure that people come out and actually understand that this power is in their hands. Mm -hmm. Less than 12%, 13% of people that are registered to vote in Lagos come out to vote. So even these powers that we ascribe to the ruling party, they're a very unpopular government. When you have only 15% of people or even less determining who is governor, then it's, these people will not represent the interests of the broader um, people that are in Lagos State. And that's why you always see there's this... There's this dysfunction. You don't see it aligning. We're about number 17 or 18 on the ease of doing business chart. Kaduna ranks, it's easier to do business hmm. in Kaduna Thank than you. Lagos. <laughs> and Kaduna is still dealing with Boko Haram issues and so many, you know, issues that they're terrorist issues that they're dealing with. And Lagos is supposed to be commercial capital of, the, of Nigeria. We should potentially be the commercial capital of Africa hmm. if we're on the right path and trajectory that we've always been on, hmm. you know. Okay, so I'm going to ask about the practicable steps that you have. You know, we just spoke about ease of doing business. What steps do you have in place to ensure that, I mean, it's easy to do business, especially considering the fact that MSMEs form the bulk of, you know, developing local economies. How are you going to ensure that, you know, it's easy to do business in Nigeria, in Lagos? Can I we mean, have process come on in that? <laughs> I think um, for, for us, when you destroy an institutions that make in a state or make a nation, you, you destroy governance, you have destroyed that nation. Mm -hmm. well, th that's a, it, it, those are the institutions that make politics, democracy, uh, that nation continuous. Like they used to say, your civil service is your barracks. Mm -hmm. Any political party that comes into it will be able to plug into the manifesto into that civil service mm -hmm. to make it work effectively. Mm -hmm. But what we have had in Lagos is 23 years of systematic destruction of Lagos state institutions. Mm -hmm. And they don't work. And when those institutions don't work, you don't have ease of being, doing business. Mm. You don't have um, um, services that people can seamlessly assess that is efficient, that is effective. Mm. You don't have, you are far away from the community. And that lack of good governance is the backbone of Lagos' problem. Mm. You, so I, I want to ask a question, like follow up on that, Princess. Now, you see, institutions, yes, civil service, they are the backbone. Mm. But there was a time in this Lagos state when Fashola was governor. Mm. I don't know about any other dispensation, right? Mm. Because I was there, you know, when he was governor actively for eight years. The civil service seemed to have worked. Mm. The same civil service, right, seemed to have worked. So are you trying to say that, um, but now it's almost like we're we are back to status quo. Because at, at that point, you drop your file, it gets to the destination and all of that. When, the, when Governor Ambadi came in, he tried to like, bypass some of those bureaucracies that happens within the civil service. And it was, you know, somehow blocked. So don't you think that when you're dealing with the Lagos State problem, where, okay, I've sorted out the governance part the, or the executive part, mm -hmm. um, the governor and everything, what would you do with your current civil service? Are you going to still keep that system? Because knowing that they can actually make or break, you know, your leadership, <laughs> no, okay, so for us, um, in, ter in terms of the civil service, and even just to your ease of doing business question, we're going to get rid of all the bottlenecks, multiple taxations, stealth taxations. For instance, in Lagos State, you have a situation where a local government will send you a tax bill, and the LCDA will also send you a tax bill. Both of them are charging you a CV license, right? And your institution does not have any TVs. Mm. You have a situation where you are trying to do business, your permits, your planning mm. for your projects to get your land consent, everything. We're going to bring a lot of innovation into governance and reduce the number of interfaces that you have to interface with a human being. Mm. 
right? In that way, you're opening up governance to a very transparent and open system that works, right? Um, in terms of the civil service, I have huge faith in the civil service. A large relative Jack on the achieved so much in four and a half years with the civil service. I think ultimately when the head of something is rotting, it, the system will just go there. And if you come into civil service and you set the standard and you set an example, right, they will have no choice but to follow through. But at the same time, there's a lot of reform that's going to happen. A lot of upward review of the salaries, starting at a minimum of 100% review to increase their salaries. Because when you pay peanuts, you get monkeys, right? And you don't want a situation where you think you're saving on your wage bill, but the opportunity cost and the damage to legal state and the government is mm. so huge. Because if people are having to bribe their way to get their planning permissions and then the building gets... It's all we're seeing. Yeah, and the building gets... The building falls and... Um, is the, what's, what's that word? Collapse. Collapses. Collapses, mm -hmm. right? That cost that you've incurred as a state yeah, is much more than that wage bill that you've increased. So you must pay properly so you can demand excellence from your civil service. So th these are some of the things that we're going to do. But innovation, innovation, innovation. I cannot stress that enough. Innovation is going to be the watchword for the civil service. And we're not going to be running a state that is inefficient. Because there's a lot of inefficiency. You know, you're almost just hiring, carrying people along. No. Lagos State needs to run like a slim, efficient machine. We are consistently harboring about 10 going up to 15% of Nigeria's population. In the next 50, 60 years, it's going to hit 400 million. Right? That's a huge amount of people that Lagos State will potentially be harboring. So we must stretch our resources as far as we can to achieve as much as we can so that these people and can plan for that in. future. And plan for that future. We must get Lagos to where it's supposed to be now mm. and then still be planning for where it's supposed to be mm. in the next 30, 40 years. Mm. And that's the foundation we're going to lay. All right, so let's quickly go on a very short break. When we come back from the break, we'll continue the conversation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, thanks for staying with us now. If you just tuned in, we're taking a deep dive into the Lagos gubernatorial race, and we have with us JRV and Princess Oyefosi. All right, so I just want to touch on lawlessness, disorderliness, street urchins, which are the things that you see commonly in the streets. And I know that, again, if we do certain level of grassroots engagement, we might be able to eradicate those things. I mean, you go everywhere, there are agbiros. Like every single place you go to. I mean, I went to <laughs> I went to an event center in Surulere. Very cute event center and everything. The next thing, uh, where did they come from? Like I, in my head, I was like, where did they come from? I mean, you are someone that truly engages with the grassroots. How do you think? First of all, is it possible to get rid of you know some of these you know vices on the on our streets in Lagos? And how do you think you know what plan is um, the Labour Party? putting a place, you know, for these people. Because, again, when you displace them, you need to put them somewhere. Yes, you're absolutely right. If a government is too far from the people, you don't really actually see what damage, what needs, what, what the community is suffering. Yeah. And right now we have a central government, a Lagos state, Alausa, that is far from the likes of people in Mushi, people in Badagri, people in Apapa. These are the places we've gone and we go to market, we go to all this deep community to speak to them and you get to realize how these people are living. You get to realize what has taken them from point A to point B and they tell, some of them tell you the history. You see grandmothers on the street and, and they tell you in my days, they, they, they cry what is Lagos going to offer my children and all, the, all that sort of thing like today we were in Mushi and the feedback the, the, we were there come selling our manifesto talking to them selling our party to um, to the people and the, the interaction with them you see that Lagos some of them wish that somebody could wake Jack on the up and mm. help us rebuild Lagos mm. it's that bad and you wonder why these young people you would be surprised, you'd be amazed that 50%, 60 even, of those agbaros you are talking about, they're graduates. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. They're actually graduate. Yes. And I know that 80% went to some formal schools. Yes. Wow. 
they come, they graduate from primary, from secondary school. Yeah. And you ask them, how do you end up here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's either the breadwinner died, there was no support mm -hmm. system from the government like you get elsewhere. They had to go on the street and dump mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. and become the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. It's either they couldn't pay their school fees. Their mm -hmm. families couldn't mm -hmm. pay their school fees. There was no way for them to get that assistance mm -hmm. or to benefit. And, and they have to go on the street. Mm -hmm. and, and all sorts of reasons. You know, mm -hmm. realize that what we have done is just we just destroy the future of Lagos. Hmm. And, I, and, I, sorry, and I want to also tag on this because the last time I was here, which was on Saturday, I walked out of this place and then the people that, the young men that knew oh, me, they all came mm -hmm. out and everything. But you know, before I give anything, you know, I always engage them. And I asked, I asked so if I really, if I bring work for you people, would you take would it? You, take it? Mm. you know what's so amazing? You see that voice that you that like, uh, once you ask that question, that voice changes. Yeah. And um, picking back on what to she P said, yeah, one of them was a graduate of Unilag, wow. Art Science Department. The other one was a graduate of Unsuka. The other one was a father. And the same thing has happened to me at Amo and Apple Junction. In literally everywhere that I choose to see them as people, as somebody's son, hmm. somebody's brother. You understand? These people are just victims of circumstance in a country and a state that does not have a plan for his youth. Right? And for us, our, our major thrust is a government with a human face, with empathy, with compassion, and a government that has the courage to actually look and say, okay, first of all, we must create an alternative means for them to earn a living, which is we must improve their employability skills, we must create incentives for companies to hire them, and localize this hiring. So for instance, there's a lot of construction work that needs to happen in our respective local governments. Before that happens, we're going to train all these youth in these different skills. local governments, give them these skills. Those that want to go into construction, those that want to perfect handwork, those that want digital skills, we're going to invest a lot in that, right? And then contra contractors that work in those local governments, they'll be incentivized to hire the people that are products and people that graduate from those systems in that local government. So we create a cyclical economy in that local government. So that is one thing that we're going to be doing. And once we've done that for about two years, we now come forcefully with the law for anybody that continues to contravene this thing. Because, you see, the reason why these people exist like this is because they are backed by the state. Yeah. The state turns, uh, turns the way to it. I mean, you saw it during the NSAR situation where BRT buses came around with like 20, 30 young men Dogs. with machets, mm. right, in front of the government's house. And the governor was sitting in his office. Mm. Till today, those boys have not been arrested. Mm. But we are not going to need that type of um, job description from our young men. Right? We don't need to suppress any votes. We are going to come in, do the work, and expect that the voters will put us back in based on our merits. So that being the case, we need to create a social engineering because you know the bigger problem? The bigger problem are those children in primary school that are seeing their big brother on the street with the plastic. And they are looking and thinking, what's the point of going to school when, when I, can I can just go and play? Because it's here. fun. You're hanging out with your friends. Mm. You're empowered by the government. You can just be busy. Well, one time I was coming back from Mojo, and there was a huge line of traffic. And we got to the front of it, and you just see there are three young boys just collecting money from people. Mm. And nobody is stopping them. Police is not stopping them. Right? And this carries on. And then this also ties into the cults. And you know, and I don't mind the devil's workshop. All the streets. The situation, and this street also ties violence into and all of street those violence, things. drugs. Mm. So you have a whole generation that's literally wasting away. Mm. So this needs to be corrected. It's a very fundamental part of our vision for Lagos, our covenant with Lagos, to ensure that we get these young men off the streets. We're not going to treat drug problems as criminal problems. We're going to treat as health problems and ensure they are rehabilitated, and make sure that they become productive members of society. Hmm. Okay, so I hear you with all of these plans. They sound absolutely wonderful. But my, um, I think my, my question is, do you have the human capital available to, to ensure that these plans actually manifest? Because, you see, it, there is a big disconnect. You have plans and they sound so beautiful and we all look forward to them. 
but the implementation of it is the problem. And I mean, if you become the governor, you become the, there's, there are so many things you can't do. You can give instructions, yes, but you're not going to be wading in on everything. You, you are not going to be there to ensure the execution, the implementation of your plans. So what, what, what is your plan to deal with? I, I think my question is the enforcement. Are you going big on enforcement or is it just going to be, well, you know what they say, oh, none. you know, I, I, that's the thing with Lagos. Yeah. You know, they go back home so, and then somebody summons you and then you're like, you eh, see, you, you see, know. You see, the, the great thing about us, uh, Princess Yufusi and myself, is we are not nonsense takers. Mm. We are the most Lagos of the takers that are on this table. And we are not, we don't take mediocrity, mm. right? So when you say you cannot enforce and you cannot supervise, we will. Because it has been done. Yeah. What Alaji Latif Jackson achieved in four and a half years, the APC government has not been able to do it in 20. Right? Because first, you set an example. Right? Your plans must also take into consideration implementation. Mm. And if you are somebody that... You see, this is the thing that we've not realized in this country. When your brain is focused on how much you can accumulate for yourself and your cronies, that same brain cannot be able to create a better life for people simultaneously. No, it absolutely. cannot work. Mm. Because, okay, a contract, a business comes to, okay, somebody comes to you and says, we can do these four real lines mm. in four years, right? And we'll do it and be able to give it to your people for this price. If your main first thing that comes to your mind is how much can I, I make from this? Yeah. You see, you have already cut short that sure. project, mm -hmm. right? But if you are thinking, what I want to do is create a quality of life for my people as mm. fast as possible, in the shortest possible time, mm. that project will fly. I'll give you an example. Look at the BRT lane. Mm. We are extremely understaffed, under, um, we are understaffed in terms of buses. Yeah. People wait at bus stations for 20, 30 minutes when they should be waiting for minimum, with maximum five, five, minutes. five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Now, you know you don't have enough buses, but you've given that BRT lane as a monopoly. Mm. Why? Why not open it up to the private sector? Any private individual that can get a bus of a certain capacity can, can use that can use that lane. lane. But because you want to ensure that you and somebody share are the ones benefiting from that <laughs> money, that is closed down. I can give you examples of all of these things in Lagos the whole day. That is why we say Lagos needs to breathe again. Mm. It's under a stranglehold. And that stranglehold is consistently about people making money for themselves. State capture. Mm. So I assure you, when you come into governance mm. with the capacity and the desire to deliver a better life for people, right? Lagos has more than the capacity in terms of the people that are here that are consistently looking for a better life and a more efficient city to pay off any project you want to do. Okay, so let, let's talk to, um, what's it called? Let, or, or let's speak to infrastructure. So Lagos has a bad habit. You see, a government comes in, does very nice this thing. You wake up one morning, everything is gone. They pack up all those metal railings. I think they, I hear they go to sell it and all of that. I mean, what, the story I took for the, the, the train derailing, I am very sure that it will be tied to somebody going to tamper with the infrastructure. So we already have this problem in Lagos, right? Again, that's why engaging this, um, the, the people on the streets would make a lot of sense, right? Saying that, okay, we're not coming to take food from your table, but instead we're coming to empower you, to exactly. give you, you know, a better life, better choices and all of that. But do you think it is possible for us to maintain quality infrastructure in Lagos? Because it seems like for every time there's an infrastructure that is constructed, I mean, we're celebrating the, sea, the, the deep seaports mm -hmm. and all of that. There was a time that Papa was celebrated. All of it, where is Papa today? You know, the, 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 the idea that infrastructures are not meant as short-lived is what is not really adding up in my head. So how do we start to think or what, what direction would you look when you're thinking building sustainable infrastructure that mm -hmm. long after you're gone, the way you've been talking about Jack on Jack on Jack on those infrastructures stand the test of time and they truly, you know, outlive many generations because it is possible. Yes. You go abroad, you see buildings a thousand years old, exactly. 800 years old. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have those kinds of infrastructure in Nigeria, especially in Lagos? Yes. Um, well, the fact of the matter is that, I, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but we lack the mentality of maintenance. We don't have maintenance, a maintenance, maintenance culture. culture yeah. And that's, that, is, that must be inbuilt into your planning for your project delivery. 
percentage of the budget that comes for that must be put there for maintenance of it consistently, right? And aside from that, we must set benchmark for quality and project delivery. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you are doing roads, and then after six months, reinforce it, washes it away. Mm -hmm. That is not acceptable. When we're even when we are working with local government chairmen, we set standards. The quality of materials that must be used, the structure of it, how it must be adhered to, and we tie the life expectancy of that road to the con to the contractor's final payment, mm. right? So these are some of the things. But more than anything, you see, the problem that we have in this country is that every government wants to build a project that they can steal from. Yeah. Ah, I was going to go there. So you see that they are not continuing projects because the deal has already been done on that one and they are not yeah. benefiting from it. So guess what? They will ignore that and continue and set up yeah. a new deal. Mm. And this is why I go back to saying that what we need most in a leader is empathy and cerebral capacity. I cannot overemphasize this. Empathy, and His Excellency Peter Albi talks about this a lot, compassion, empathy. A love for your people is what Jan Kode had love for the people. You saw it in how he went on project delivery. In a year, look at what he did to the education system. Mm. Right? So this is a fundamental thing that must be put in place. And once that is there, you will think through all of these things. Maintenance culture must be there because you want your project to last as long as possible. Another thing is we will not limit the level of project delivery to the purse strings of the state. We are going to create an enabling environment for the private sector. So investors can so come investors in. can come. Because mm. really, the state has no business building infrastructure. Mm. The state can come in to subsidize when you want to look at the price points it will come to the residents for and say, okay, we want it to be affordable, so we will come in with this amount of money, but the core amount of money will come in from the private sector mm. because Lagos State can pay off itself. We have enough people that want to be on the train, that want to go on the ferries, that want to use intermodal transport. Whatever you are looking for, Nigerians and Lagosians want to move in an efficient way because think about how productive we are, mm. right? With all the traffic, with all of those things. Now, imagine if you did not have those things. On Sunday, I had about eight meetings right and i when i was going to sleep i was like wow this was a very productive day because there was no traffic yeah. i was able to have i attended three churches in ikeja i had a radio interview with um in ikeja with Bufai. i then went to amu had four or five meetings then came back to lekki had another meeting so i was very happy with myself now imagine if that was the everyday life of Lagosians. ah yeah. that would be heaven <laughs> now imagine imagine how much more money Lagosians will make. make yeah and that's where we need to get to so, Princess, and those institutions yes. you are talking about, like you go overseas, they don't just they maintain themselves. There's a framework exactly. for sustainability. There's a yes. framework for regulation. Yes. There's a framework for monitoring. When you don't have that in government, there is no way you can build infrastructure all you like. You are going to go back to ground zero. zero. Mm -hmm. Because there is no regulatory body that is accountable mm. to, for the, to the public, to Absolutely. the people. Absolutely. There is no sustainability strategy. And the government of Lagos State is too far from its people. Mm. So why do you think Way we should far. vote for you, Princess Oyefusi and GRV? Let me start with you first, then GRV can wrap so, up the conversation. <laughs> for us, in, uh, we are, like um, my principal said, we are Lagosian. We are the true Lagos ticket here. And we understand. I was born and bred in Lagos. And I've lived in all the four corners of Lagos East. I've, I went to primary school in Kushofe. My dad had a big estate in Bagada Phase 1. We lived there. I went to secondary school in Atikorodu before I tra traveled out. So we've moved from everywhere. We moved literally from the five Ibile Lagos. So we understood the problems of Lagos. Mm. And we know from coming from where we come with our background in terms of education in terms of the experience that we're bringing we know we see the problem because we go to the people and we see the problem of Lagos mm. and we know that with the plans that we've got in our manifesto we say, these are plans that are they're not gigantic plan that you know oh they will never deliver mm. they're plans that you'll be able to measure in day one, this is what they said they were doing 100 days in office. Mm -hmm. This is what they, they said they were doing year one. You can hold us accountable mm -hmm. for it. And, they, uh, and what the key thing is that we are going to take government away from Alausa. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. We're taking government to Badagri. Hmm. We're taking government to Ikorodo. We're bringing government to the people hmm. Hmm. so they can see the real benefit of the taxes. Of they can the re taxes. see the real development in their community. And we're going to make sure that this local government work for the community that they are in. Mm. They have to benefit. That's the essence of local government. Yes. What is the point of having a local government if your inner rules are just as bad mm. and they don't exist? You're, you can't have health care in the community. Yeah. You have to go to general hospital. All those basic things that local government does, your refuge collection. Why is it the state that is collecting exactly. refuge in that Ikorodu? Exactly. And we have local government. Five How local do you then even create employment? Exactly. <laughs> okay, so, so Jeremy. That, that sort of... That, that's that why sort of bringing government closer to, to the people. people. So they can see the benefit, mm. the deficiency of democracy, the deficiency of good governance, and the accountability of good governance. You're going to see the openness. You're going to be able to hold us accountable. Okay. You're going to say, I will lay here. One new Okunidi. Okay, I wish I understood that. Yeah, I'm going to translate. <laughs> because here in Lagos, these people can be traced back to the... So, Jeremy, we have like a minute. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Um, so, I'm going to build on everything my deputy has said, Princess Lama, to you, if you see, because that really talks to the core of what we're trying to bring. A government that is servant leadership driven, a government that wants to bring go good governance close to the people, we build policies with the people, a government that ensures that, you know, Unlike what is currently happening in Lagos State, where they are, you are, they are paying money for a flyover, and it costs times four hmm. the price that it should actually cost. Hmm. They are doing a 16-kilometer rail for money that could have done 175-kilometer rail. You know, we want accountability, openness. We are going to be publishing these things to the public, right? Transparency, so that even we, so set we can even vet exactly. So then it now takes on a life of its own. Hmm. So that the resources we have can go as far as possible. But more than anything, there are so many... You see, Lagos is more than Lagos Central and mm. Lagos Island. Mm. There are so many people that have been dispossessed of land in Ekpe, in Ikurudu, in Ojo, in Badagri. We want to make them feel they are part of Lagos again. And we are going to look at all the social injustices that have happened throughout this time in Lagos State with an aim to create a state that works for the people and centers their interests. We're mm. going to tackle youth unemployment, we're going to deliver four rail lines in four years, and we're going to ensure we tackle the housing crisis by ensuring that we have affordable housing. Awesome. Mm. On that note, <laughs> good evening, my dear beautiful sisters, what are you saying? Um, we thank God for our dear brother and princess for the dreams and plans of Lagos. I pray that the la their labor of love will never be in vain. Amen. There are a lot of things that need to be put in place in Lagos. And with all I have heard, I know the both of them have plans for hope for the hopeless. God bless you both. Uh, Lagos needs a facelift and God can use you both to do it. Sister, well, welcome back. I missed you on Friday. I missed myself too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Someone says, Lagos is the fourth largest economy in Africa. Mm. So I want us to transform that into success. Thank you so much for watching. Now, if you missed our quote for today, um, here it is again. Where's our quote? So long as we have enough people in this country willing to fight for their rights, will be called a democracy. We'll see sure. you guys tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Enjoy.